So back at it. Chapters 20 to 24. Some very <laughs> terrifying scenes yeah. in, this, in this part of the book. And probably the worst scene of all, in my opinion, but there are plenty of bad ones. Uh, last week, last week was the discussion of the uh, mass graves, uh, large scale death pits where they were just throwing the bodies in. And we were talking about how that was reminiscent of the uh, reminiscent of the concentration camps, which is certainly intentional on Camus part. He wants us to think about the concentration camps throughout Europe during the Nazi occupations. Um, but now, well, let's dive into the situation in chapter 20. Raymond's escape. <laughs> Raymond, Rambert, um, has kind of kept in the back of his mind that he's going to go ahead and still get out. <clears throat> but in the meantime, he's helping with the sanitary squads. <clears throat> um, it's interesting. It seems as if he wants people to stop him. <laughs> um, right. He goes and talks to Ryu. Ryu, he asks him, why don't you stop my going? You could easily manage it. Because every time he tells Ryu, Ryu's like, okay, great, cool, awesome, have a good time. <laughs> and it's, it's as though Raymond wants him to stop him. <laughs> it's like he, he's asking for, he, he, wants the, he wants a lecture. Yeah. He doesn't want to do it himself. You know, he wants to be pushed a little bit. Why don't you push me, Ryu? Why don't you just push me a little bit? Uh, yeah. But Ryu's like, nope. <laughs> uh, he, Ryu says, it's none of my business. You have elected, Rambert, Rambert had elected for happiness, and he had no argument to put up against him. Personally, yeah. he felt incapable of deciding which was the right course and the wrong in a case. Uh, didn't he, uh, how to say that, didn't he manage to stay with his friends and help them, help them with pandemic or some kind of that? Well, that's what we're getting to now. Oh, okay, okay. These, these, <laughs> because I don't know actually what is the order by chapters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't talk about actions in chapters. Yeah, so I'm, this is right at the, at the beginning of 20. He's still trying. He, yeah. uh, if you look here on the screen, he stays with those two guards, the brothers, Marcel and Louis, yeah. who are the, out of the criminals, those are the only two French names. All the criminals are Spanish. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny. I, I don't know. That we were talking French about this. Bad guys, I don't know why. Maybe I think I, I don't know. <laughs> like we maybe were because they were with Nazis, some kind of. Maybe, but maybe. I mean, there were Francisco also. Francisco Franco and. The, uh, but there was guys. yeah, but there were Spaniards fighting against him too. There was a resistance also. Um, yeah, I'm joking, just but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knows? We were talking about this last week, and it's you know ironic that there are no Arabs, but there are Spaniards and we were thinking maybe he was ironically putting the Spaniards instead of Arabs in yeah. this town, which is, which should be full of Arabs. Um, so uh, yeah. So he says, uh, maybe I would like to help you with your happiness is what Rio says. Uh, that's his attitude. Uh, yeah. Then he goes to stay with those two guards. He meets their mother. The mother is also pushing him to go forward. Nobody's trying to stop him. And it's like, he's, it seems to me, now this is not from the study guide, this is not directly stated in the book, but it really seems to me like he wants somebody to tell him, don't do it. But everybody's like, sure, fine, go for it. Let me know how it goes. Nobody cares about him, actually. It's, so that's much. partially it, because Ryu is always very matter of fact. Ryu yeah. always says, look, I have more important things to worry about. Yes, and yeah. when they met first time, he didn't want to help him. And he said, figure it out by yourself. Yeah, and he, he even says, you know, let, let me know how it goes. I'll be yeah. uh, listening with interest to your progress. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the old woman, the, the mother of Marcel and Louis, it's funny also, by the way, that the mother is Spanish. So we kind of get the picture that Marcel and Louis are also half Spanish and they must have been born here. That, that means their father must be French, 
Yeah. It's funny because none of that is written, but you can figure it out because the mother is Spanish and the brothers are named Marcel and Louis. So you maybe can... their father is in prison. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, so the the old woman, she's religious. Uh, she asks Rambert, "Don't you believe in God?" And when he says no, she says, "Ah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, you must go back to that girl, <laughs> or else yeah. what would be left for you? It's like if you don't have God." You might as well go to your wife. Uh, that's it. And I put this question at the end. Doesn't he seem to be expecting to be lectured? He wants somebody to say, now, why should you be so selfish, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody will do it. it it's good, though, because that means when he makes the decision, it's really him. It's nobody pushing him, you know? Yes. In Serbia, uh, people would push him, I, I'm sure. Yeah. They will tell him their story about that. Yeah. Their opinions. Um, so, yeah, he goes, he decides to stay. Uh, he goes, uh, uh, he talks to Ryu, of course. He goes to I Ryu. Think, Ryu. Uh, he went to sanitary. Yeah, sanitary they, yeah, there is a clinic. Every, just at this point, just about every major building in the city is some kind of medical, <laughs> makeshift medical facility. They have quarantine camps, they have makeshift hospitals, and then infrastructure concerned with the transportation of the dead. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's <laughs> the, the, almost <laughs> the entire city is that way. Uh, so Rambert says he's thought it over carefully and his views hasn't changed, but if he went away, he would feel ashamed of himself and that would embarrass his relations with the woman he loved. Showing more animation, Ryu told him, that was sheer nonsense. There's nothing shameful in preferring happiness. Certainly, he says, but it may be shameful to be happy by oneself. So this is interesting um, for a number of reasons. He says it may be shameful to be happy by oneself. And by oneself means with his wife. <laughs> yes. um, so that's kind of casting himself out of the city of Oran and being alone, that is to be with his wife. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, he realizes <clears throat> he might not be able to live with himself. Or he might not be able to live with his, with his wife if he just leaves. He says, until now, I always felt a stranger in this town and that I had no concern with you people. But now that I've seen what I've seen, I know that I belong here, whether I want it or not. This business is everybody's business. Um, he still, when he's saying all this, <clears throat> he's expecting Ryu to applaud him now. Yeah, but this thing, applauded Yeah, because for Ryu, you're just doing the normal thing. <laughs> yeah. There's no reason for applause in Ryu's eyes. You know, he's like, okay, great. Raymond asks Ryu, haven't you made a choice to reject happiness? In other words, to, uh, to work ceaselessly, not try to get to his own wife, to Ryu's wife. And Ryu, as coolly as ever, says, forgive me, Rambert. Well, I simply don't know. <laughs> but stay with yeah. us if you want to. See, he's yeah. always, he always deflates. He's so cold, I don't know. Yeah. He, he, has, <laughs> he has not uh, emotion. <clears throat> he's very calculating. Um, and he's def he, he deflates people's expectations and egos. So that's the thing, you know. First, Raymond was expecting to be lectured and people try to stop him. Then he was hoping to be applauded. <coughs> uh, at least that's how it seems in the dialogue. He gets all emotional. He gets annoyed and says, haven't you made the decision to reject happiness? And Rambert says, or, sorry, Rio says, I don't know. Say if you want. Uh, he says, nothing in the world is worth turning one's back on what one loves, yet that is what I'm doing. This is Ryu talking, though why, I do not know. Again, we have this thing in which uh, Ryu doesn't know why he does what he does, and he doesn't care either. <laughs> He's like, yeah. we can talk about that some other time. Yeah. That's his whole attitude. Ah, Ryu said, a man can't cure and know at the same time. There it is. He's like, I don't know, 
because I'm curing. A man can't cure and know at the same time, so let's cure as quickly as we can. That's the more urgent job. He's just thinking about his patients. Exactly. And, you know, about his job, not about personal problems. Yeah. And relationship problems. I think that Camus would even still want to hold back on saying that it's about the job. <laughs> um, I think that even if Ryu had not studied medicine as a profession, he would still be doing this kind of thing because it's the person that he is. Yeah. You know, I don't think, I don't think uh, Camus would say, oh, it's I'm just doing my job. We talked about this a couple episodes ago. Uh, it, that's a bit of a problem. That's the defense that, uh, that Nazi camp guards used in their trials. They said, yeah. I'm just, I was just doing my job. So it's not, I don't think it's good enough to say I'm just doing my job. It's uh, something like the world is a hospital <laughs> and you're either a patient or you're trying to help in some way. Those are the two things you can be. I forget who said that. There's a saying to that effect. And that's kind of what this book is all about. Um, so even, I, I don't think it's, I don't think we should use the word job, but yes, it just happens to be the fact that Ryu is a doctor. Um, and, and so he's, you know, very capable of curing, but the book always wants to make the point to us that even if Ryu is a skilled doctor, it doesn't matter. The plague is unstoppable. Um, it's, you know, Ryu is not, it doesn't have what it takes. Nobody has what it takes to stop the plague, to stop. It's like nobody has what it takes to stop the weather. <laughs> yeah. that, and it's always that, you know, that's why the weather is such a big part of this book. Uh, it does what it's doing. It doesn't care about plagues. It doesn't care about people suffering. It doesn't care about people being happy. It just does what it does. Nature is quiet on the, on the topic. <laughs> Um, so a couple of comparisons to make here. Both Raymond and Cotard have come to feel a sense of belonging, interestingly enough. Yes. But What's they're obviously reason? very different characters. Uh, you know? So what's the difference? I, I mean, is there a difference? Uh, yeah. Do you want to say or? Yeah. No, go ahead. I want to hear what you think. Uh, sense of belonging. I don't know. Like Cotard I mean, think, was mm -hmm. at uh, you know at the beginning, he was always healthy. I would say always he healthy. He made his uh, changed his mind so a lot. And, well, Cotard uh, never also he's never. He's also stranger, but yeah, I don't know how to say. He's a traveler, and he has that sense of belonging everywhere. I would say something like that. But he did it everywhere. But he was an he felt like an outsider because of his status as a criminal, and it wasn't until the plague came that he became friendly. No, Remember? yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, you're That's right. what Grand said because Grand is his neighbor, uh, and Cotard felt alienated uh, and so much that he tried to kill himself, and then after yeah. the plague came. Suddenly, Cotard is great. He feels fantastic. He loves everything that's happening. Also, he's making money as a smuggler. Yeah. Um, he's, on, he's on the black market doing his thing. He's doing his muchke. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they also, both, they are both, uh, both involved in criminal activity, something like that. Yeah, but because from, Raymond wanted to escape. But from know, two, yeah, but from. And they are also. Uh, They're coming from two opposite lives. ends, though. That's that's um, kind of similar. Yeah, that, that's true. Them. No, that's a good yeah. point. But they're also coming at it from different sides, where Cotard is the <laughs> provider and Raymond is the consumer. And I would um, say also that Ra Raymond, uh, you know, uh, this plague was a shock for him, especially because he didn't uh, imagine himself you know, in that position. He just wanted to visit his girlfriend, but Cotard, you know, it was good for him that the plague started. Not good, but you know. It is, he though. Was, he was, uh, how to say that? Cotard yeah. is, is an interesting character because for him it is good. Yes, he, he likes it. He's in that situation, how to say that. He's profiting he from it, and uh, yeah. 
whenever they ask, so they don't they don't give Raymond any lectures, but they ask yeah. Cotard. They ask Cotard, "Hey, why don't you help?" And he says, "I don't. It's not my fault. I can't do anything. Besides, it probably won't help anyway. The plague is yeah. unstoppable. And anyhow, I'm doing fine. Like and he has all these excuses, uh, why he can't help, why it's not his fault, and blah blah blah." Um, Raymond eventually feels a conscience, and I think that's probably the big difference between them is that Raymond has some sense of conscience. Uh, yes. Cotard does not have a conscience, I don't think. Yeah, Cotard is crazy, like the situation. Yeah. In which he yeah. Is. I mean, you so got to think. He did well, and you know. Cotard is a rat. <laughs> He's, yeah. He thrives during the plague actually the rats don't even thrive they they die too so he's some kind of super rat that <laughs> that thrives during the plague um and raymond raymond is not raymond uh just he has a sense of, of conscience um now they both feel like they belong but for very different reasons now another uh you, you'll notice that throughout the book there are parallels that are also contrasts uh for example there's the parallel where before the plague people behaved as if they were parts of a machine and they didn't think about their life too much and they just did business and uh and each they, person they suddenly started to care about each other and... yes and no though because it they did and then they didn't because after when the plague reaches its peak uh everyone has seen so much horror that they sort of begin to behave like automatons again but in a different way it's interesting because uh ryu talks about how people began to not really think about anything where they're just moving and at some point all of the death it just be you just don't see it anymore you're just yeah. moving. You're just doing things. For Ryu, it's going around. It's uh, treating patients. For Ryu, is the same, you know. I don't know. He, but everybody he becomes... Back, it's so cold, you know. Rather, it was a plague. Or he was always realist. But it says that, that happens to a lot of people, not just yeah. him. <clears throat> they just become yes. numb. but And they go through their days just trying to deal with the one thing in front of them. They don't have time to think about anything else other problems and um yeah they're just trying to get some other people they don't have time to consider it. but the point is in both cases people wind up in this mechanical state life before the plague and life during the plague take on this mechanistic tone and there again we get this ironic parallel but it's obviously very different yeah. you know people are moving like zombies through the plague uh <clears throat> but before they were moving like zombies through the business world now, well, business world, I don't know if that's the best way to put it. it. The way that life was described before the plague was that even social interactions were transactional, you know, like, like matters of business, even talking and, you know, going through your social existence was a kind of transactional thing. <clears throat> I, I think the difference, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> there's a huge difference just in the, the literal sense that there's a massive plague going on. But uh, as far as what people are, it's like before they were ignoring the fact that their future is not promised to them. Because even when there's not a plague, that's true. Even when there's not a plague, Ryu would tell you the plague is always there even if it's even if you don't see it even yeah. if there's not a an outbreak of the plague um now people know it and they're just kind of trying to survive moving through it um doing whatever they can and it doesn't always inspire unity uh, as we'll see in the coming scenes when they go to the uh quarantine camp people are becoming suspicious of each other. They're getting paranoid. So it's not always the case that it brings out solidarity. That's one possible response is to, to achieve solidarity. Another possible response 
is to break down socially and to suspect everyone else. And that Camus wants us to see all of the possible, or let's say many of the possible responses to yeah. the situation. Um, so yeah, one of the most horrible scenes, uh, the fates mm -hmm. of Panalu and, and she Jean. died. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, other people are going to watch this video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I forgot that. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, he dies. But um, first is the terrible scene with young Jacques Othon, the son of the uh, minister, the police, uh, sorry, the police commissioner. Uh, yeah, the son of Monsieur Othon has contracted the plague. There's a terrible scene where pretty much everybody, all the main characters, uh, are trying to save the child using Castell's new serum. He has a new batch that he's made. And um, it's different this time. They've seen children die before, but they spend so much time with this one child <clears throat> that it affects them very deeply. Uh, needless to say, the pain inflicted on these innocent victims, children, had always seemed to them to be, in fact, what it was, an abominable thing, a terrible thing. But hitherto, they had felt its abomination in an abstract way. They had never had to witness over so long a period the death throes of an innocent child. So they kind of get close to this one child. Uh, and uh, the child passes away over a long, agonizing period of time. Uh, Panalu cries out, God save this child, please, um, but to no avail. Um, and this is the one time, I think the one or one of very few times, that Ryu actually gets angry. Uh, it's uh, throughout the book, there are places where Ryu is accused of thinking in terms of abstract ideas and numbers. For example, Rambert accuses him of that when he first uh, meets him. And uh, actually when he goes to get, try to get a pass to get outside of the town, um, Rambert accuses him, you, you know nothing of love. You think in abstractions. Um, so this is, uh, and that's true, Ryu does. He tries to imagine ways to make the people in the town understand without using numbers because numbers are not convincing, you know, nobody, nobody reacts to statistics the way that they should. So this one child provokes Ryu to become angry at Panalu as they leave the room. Ryu says, ah, that child anyhow was innocent. So this goes back to how <clears throat> uh, Panalu says, my brothers, you deserve this. This is something you deserve. That's why Ryu becomes angry with Panalu. He's saying, that's not a good explanation. That child doesn't deserve this. Um, and uh, Panalu says, but perhaps we should love what we cannot understand. Ryu straightened up slowly. He gazed at Panalu, summoning to his gaze all the strength and fervor he could muster against his weariness. Then he shook his head. No, father, I have a very different idea of love. Until my dying day, I shall refuse to love a scheme of things in which children are put to torture. Um, Panalu responds by saying, I just now learned what grace means. <laughs> um, remember, Panalu's position is that this is a deserved punishment coming from on high. Uh, like he spoke in his sermons. Also. He spoke what? Oh, yeah, his sermons, yeah. yes. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> Ryu can't abide that explanation uh first of all because ryu is not a believer but yeah. even aside from that just the for ryu the idea that there's a reason that a child should be put to torture yeah. is is abominable there's there's no reason for that uh and this is where they they disagree and panalu is very shaken by this by the death of this child uh he's humbled uh, he doesn't, uh, it, it obviously shakes him. Uh, 
Panelu holds out his hand to Ryu, saying regretfully, and yet I haven't convinced you. That is to say, convinced you that, that this is all part of God's plan. Uh, Ryu responds, saying, what does it matter? What I hate is death and disease, as you well know. And whether you wish it or not, we're allies facing them and fighting them together. So they affirm their solidarity in spite of their differences. Ryu was still holding Panelu's hand. So you see, but he refrained from meeting the priest's eyes. God himself can't part us now. So Panelu also uh, becomes more humble after this, and he has a second sermon. Uh, interestingly, he only invites the men to this sermon. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a second, though. As they're talking uh, the next day, Panelu drops this hint. Uh, when one day he told Ryu, okay, one day, and maybe not the next day, with a smile, he was working on an essay entitled, Is a Priest Justified in Consulting a Doctor? Yeah, uh, about his situation. Yeah, Probably. but we don't know about that yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's funny. I, it's very passive, like not passive aggressive. It's a passive communication. Like I could write a story for... Uh, I could write a story for somebody titled, Hey, can I have that piece of chocolate? <laughs> right? It's like, oh, okay. I wonder what that story is about. <clears throat> um, so Ryu had gathered that something graver lay beyond behind the question that the priest's tone seemed to imply. So Ryu suspects that there might be a problem. So Panelu has a second sermon. There's high winds that day. In fact, winds interrupt the sermon at some point. Uh, so there's a lot of wind. And he only invites the men. I forgot to put that up here. Uh, I have some opinion, but I don't know. Okay, I, let's hear I it. I forgot because I forgot uh, what was in your book, but maybe uh, men are more responsible than, than women. I think, I think... Like this, and they are maybe head of families, especially because it was in mid uh, 20th uh, century. And maybe, you know, that was strong. That, that, that he thinks that? Man, I don't know, in that time. Well, I mean, he is uh, a churchman. Um, that could be my suspicion, is that he knows he's about to do a sermon that is basically saying, hey, look, some children are going to die, and that's all part of the plan. And he doesn't want to say that to mothers. That's that's my yeah, opinion. Yeah, something like that because men are stronger and maybe because well, also they're not the mothers. I mean, like yeah, to to tell a room full of mothers that look, yeah, I can't children, imagine that scene. Yeah, <laughs> that your children are going to die and it's fine. <laughs> it's yeah. it's all part of a a grand plan. I think he can't bring himself. That's just my opinion. It doesn't really say why. Yeah, I think uh, also that is. Yeah. Um, so, by the way, uh, there's a side note here that a lot, there are fewer people at the second sermon, not just because of it being only men, but also because a lot of people had just stopped being religious and instead had gotten into all kinds of uh, uh, superstitions and little rituals to try to avoid the plague um, and prophecies. They, they started reading all the prophecies they could find. They were looking back at the old uh, Nostradamus and anything they could find to try to see what was going to happen, to try to see the future. Uh, it became profitable for the local printing firms. They started pandering to this new craze and printed large numbers of prophecies that people had been circulating in manuscript. So the newspaper started collecting all these little prophecies and, and publishing them for profit. Uh, it also goes on to say that after they ran out of those, they just had their journalists write some new ones <laughs> because people were so hungry for any feeling of control, any way that they could talk about the future. Because remember, every time someone thinks about the future, they immediately feel their heart break uh, yeah. be because they're what future? <laughs> they don't know that they'll have a future. In fact, they probably won't. Um, so anytime they can find a way to get a hold of the future for a second, it feels good. So 
these prophecies become very popular. So the sermon itself, though, Ryu comes to watch. Uh, the first thing to note is that uh, the, uh, Panelu seems a bit more uh, humble. He speaks in a gentler, more thoughtful tone. Uh, and he stumbles over his words sometimes. So he's definitely been deeply affected by the death of the child. Yeah. Uh, it's made him really question everything. But he decides to double down. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you know that phrase, double down, uh, he, he decides to go harder. Um, he does also say we now instead of you. When he had the first sermon, he said, brothers and sisters, you deserve it. Now he says we. Uh, so he's, uh, he's feeling the solidarity. Yeah, maybe he's skeptical about himself. And he's what, what? Maybe he is also skeptical about himself. Yeah, he's feeling doubt for yeah, sure. Yeah, because maybe he blamed himself of the child's death and because he was out of power, maybe he suspicions himself. I think he suspects, it, this is a, what is called in, in religious uh, speak, a crisis of faith. Yeah. He's having a crisis of faith, or he had one, but this, by the time we get to the sermon, he seems to have found his way through. Uh, even though he seems shaken, uh, he basically says that there is no half marker. You either believe everything or believe nothing. There's no in-between. Uh, he says, my brother, the time of testing has come for us all. We must believe everything or deny everything. And who among you, I ask, would dare to deny everything? This is leading up to him uh, saying that we must accept our fate. He says, or it says, he made no doubt that the ugly word fatalism, so that would typically mean being uh, resigned to your fate. In other words, not struggling against it. Uh, the ugly word fatalism would be applied to what he said. Well, he would not boggle, he would not be surprised at that word, provided he were allowed to add the adjective active fatalism. So he does, he, he's changed because he's helping now. Uh, if you recall, when we first see him in this chapter, he's in the clinic helping. He's helping fight the plague, which seems contrary to what he said. Right. He was saying this is all part of the plan, but it seems he's come to a kind of conclusion that says, I'm going to fight the plague in other people, but for myself, I will, I will do nothing. Uh, that's kind of his position here. Yeah. So that's the active part is he does, he's now in the struggle instead of lying down and not fighting against creation. Uh, no, we should go forward, groping our way through the darkness. This is his part of his sermon. Stumbling at times, there's a scooter going by outside. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, yeah. Stumbling perhaps at times and try to do what good lay in our power. As for the rest, we must hold fast, trusting in the divine goodness, even as to the deaths of little children and not seeking personal respite. So that's rest. You know, we shouldn't seek personal comfort. We should help uh, doing what we can. Uh, when Ryu was preparing to leave the church, a violent gust of wind swept up the nave. That's like the main part of the church floor. Uh, through the half open doors and buffeted the faces of the departing congregation. So they all get blasted by the wind on the way out. There are some priests talking who are listening to the sermon. Uh, the elder priest uh, says, actually, we get this. Uh, Ryu's account. So Ryu says that the elder piece paid tribute to the preacher's eloquence, but the boldness of thought Panelu had shown gave him pause. So the elder priest is like, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he's a bit heretical. In his opinion, the sermon had displayed more uneasiness than real power. So the priest doesn't like, the elder, elder priest doesn't like that Panelu seems humbled. At yeah. Panelu's age, a priest had no business to feel uneasy. Uh, the younger priest says, well, wait, do you hear about this essay that he's writing? So remember, we heard the title earlier. The title 
was should a priest consult with a doctor and then the younger priest gives us the answer to the question his essay is about that it's illogical for a priest to call in a doctor <laughs> um, yeah. i was thinking about this line and the way that it's phrased uh illogical I, I don't know. I haven't come to any conclusions about that. Why would the priests say that's illogical? It seems like uh, the priests yeah. are not founding their uh, positions on logic. They're founding their positions on faith. Uh, so the illogical part is a little strange for me. I, I haven't thought it through entirely, honestly. Um, maybe the priest was just using the word illogical as shorthand for illogical for a priest. So illogical for a priest, meaning using a priest's logic. <laughs> I don't know. Um, then Father yeah. Panelu falls ill. Uh, his symptoms are different. Uh, okay, so first of all, yeah, he's housed with uh, this older woman who, by the way, he, he angers her it, right from the beginning. Somehow, I forget what he did. He does something to make her annoyed with him. So she doesn't really talk to him that much. Uh, he starts to get ill though, and then she does start checking on him. Um, he refuses to call for you. <clears throat> so this is his thing. I fight for other people, but for me, I'm going to lie down and take my fate. Uh, as she quaintly put it, the old, we only have the old woman's testimony on what happened. As she quaintly put it, he looked as if he'd been severely thrashed all night long, more dead than alive. She was greatly struck by the apathy of his voice. So she asks, how are you feeling? And he says, I'm in a bad way. He doesn't have feeling in his voice. He's not, uh, he doesn't have the voice of a suffering man, let's say. He doesn't have the voice of anything. He just, his voice is empty. He just uh, wants to meet his fate and yeah, but so it's like he, he has no... He that everything is in God's hands and that nobody can help me but God. Uh, but God. Yeah, and there's the, nothing he can do about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, when he finally accepts that he has a serious illness and probably the plague, <clears throat> he says, don't call the doctor, just take me to the hospital to comply with the regulations. And so she does so. She calls uh, to get him taken to the hospital. <clears throat> when Ryu finally sees him, uh, he says, you have none of the specific symptoms of the disease, but I admit one can't be sure and I must isolate you. So Panelu goes into isolation and true to his word, Panelu dies seeking no he help for himself. Uh, Panelu's eyes kept their blank serenity. And when next morning he was found dead, his body drooping over the bedside, they betrayed nothing. Against his name, the index card recorded doubtful case. Yeah, because he had none of the uh, symptoms. Well, uh, he he coughed up blood. I guess he's supposed to be. I don't remember if it says specifically. I guess he's supposed to be one of the new pneumonic plague. The plague changes to a pneumonic yeah. plague, um, and I guess Panelu is one of the first. Okay trip to the stadium. So we go to a quarantine camp that's been uh, put into a stadium. Here's an actual picture of a quarantine camp in a stadium. <laughs> Obviously not the one in the book, which is fictional. Um, yeah. Maybe that's Spanish flu or something like that. Kind of what? Well, maybe it's Spanish flu. I think it is Spanish flu, actually, yes. Because it was in, that, in those times. Yeah. Um, earlier, but yeah. Yeah, um, at the end of the first world war something. yes um so it starts off with a note about the weather because we always have to hear about the weather <clears throat> um november 1st that's all saints day uh the day after halloween which is actually not just some pagan holiday uh in the christian calendar uh I, I'm not sure about any Orthodox calendar. I think it is something, but... Yeah, uh, in Orthodox uh, calendar, there is St. Luca, I think. Okay. That day. Um, it's the, the Day of the Dead. Um, and actually, this is November 1st. They ignored the Day of the Dead. We'll talk about that in a second, though. The, the weather was seasonable. In other words, the weather was normal for that time of year. 
uh, there had been a sudden change and the great heat had gone away, had given place to a mild autumnal air. In other years, a cool wind blew all day, uh, as in other years. So it's the same. Cool wind blew all day, big clouds raced from one horizon to the other, trailing shadows over the houses. So we get this thing again, where the weather is just doing what it normally does while people are going through extraordinary circumstances. So is the message here from Camus that the seasons go on as usual, uh, despite the plague, or is the message that the plague, that like plague and war, seasons come and go, whether or not people are ready for them, or is there a third interpretation? Or I think it's actually a combination of those two things. <clears throat> uh, nature is silent on the subject, basically. It's the unreasonable silence of the universe. Um, people have no desire to note the day of the dead. Uh, it says that the dead were intruders whom you would rather forget. This is why the day of the dead this year was tacitly, quietly, but willfully ignored. As Cotard dryly remarked, uh, Taru noted that the habit of irony was growing on him more and more. By the way, Taru, we talked about this last time, Taru's trying to figure out Cotard because Taru's thing is he knows everything. T Taru's like, I understand everyone. But he can't figure out Cotard. Cotard's a mystery for him. Uh, anyway, Cotard says, each day was for us a day of the dead. <laughs> so they just ignored the day of the dead. Uh, they go to the quarantine camp and the people, they await death in individual tents alone. Uh, Rambert, Taru, and Gonzalez visit the stadium. They got Gonzalez to help out. That's good. Uh, see, Gonzalez is feeling the solidarity. Uh, Gonzalez is also the football fan. He's always trying to find ways to kick something, uh, you know, like throw something up and catch it on the top of his foot. Uh, he's always doing stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and he, when they're at the stadium, he says, wow, well, at least I get to come to the stadium. Um, so yeah, they go to the stadium. It says that, yeah, they have individual tents, but during the day they hang out in the bleachers, they hang out in the, the seats. And uh, yeah, on entering the stadium, they found the stands full of people like the picture that we saw. Uh, the field was covered with the tents in which you could see uh, bedding and bundles of clothes. What do they do with themselves all day? Tabru asks. Uh, Rambert says, nothing. So these people have been reduced to not struggling anymore. They've lost their struggle. Uh, so um, there is something to be said about uh, some of the stories of prisoners in concentration camps would become like the walking dead, would become, would surrender themselves and no longer fight, no longer have hope. Uh, and it's kind of the imagery that we get here. <clears throat> These are people who have given up. They sit around and wait uh, for something to happen. Um, it says also that uh, they lost their sympathy for one another. This is what we were talking about earlier. As the camp got overcrowded, fewer and fewer people were inclined to play the part of the sympathetic listener. They had no choice but to hold their peace and nurse their mistrust of everything and everyone. One had indeed a feeling that suspicion was falling uh, from the sky. So everyone is suspicious of everyone else. So solidarity has been destroyed <laughs> in the camp among these people that doesn't mean that you know must always happen in in a quarantine camp it's just one thing that can happen one out of but many I think things people uh you know get mad when some time passes and they are being stressful and yeah they go crazy something like that. well it's funny because uh some of the people realize solidarity and some of the people don't but they're all kind of cast about by things inside of them. Yeah. Uh, for Ryu, it's who knows what. He doesn't know what it is. It's like everyone inside them has their own weather, <laughs> right? That thing that they can't really control or explain, <clears throat> they have to react to. Um, uh, 
Monsieur Othon is there. Uh, he says, I hope Jacques did not suffer too much. This is the first time Teru had heard him utter his son's name, and he realized that something had changed. The sun was setting and flooding through a rift in the clouds. The, the level rays raked the stands, tinging their faces with a yellow glow. No, Teru said, no, I couldn't really say he suffered. So Teru yeah. mercifully lies to Monsieur Othon because nobody could tell him the terror <laughs> of what happened to his child. And um, his wife, where is she? I, is she also in camp? Or? She is in a camp, but I don't think we get a discussion on that. At least not yet. Um, everyone because had. I remember that uh, they were at camp and that their son was, son was in. Camp. Well, they were they were at home, and then uh, yeah. they uh, Ryu had to pay a visit and check on the son, and he said yes. He has symptoms, which means immediately the whole family has to go into quarantine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, they're separate camps for men and women. Yeah. So, yeah, the wife is in a quarantine camp also. The quarantine camps lower the town's morale and the weather shifts again. Breaches of the peace and minor riots became more frequent. So people are fighting. They're probably storming the gates trying to get out. Uh, as November closes, the mornings turned uh, much colder. Heavy downpours, so that's rain, had scoured the streets and washed the sky clean of clouds. In the mornings, a weak sunlight bathed the town in a cold, sparkling sheen. <clears throat> okay. Now we get uh, a conversation. The conversation between Taru and Ryu. This is where we get some information about Taru, finally, something about his life. Uh, he says to Ryu, let's take a break for an hour and be friends. Uh, it's a good thing. I, I, I mean, it's a good thing. That was a really dry way of saying things. It, this, this scene, I think, emphasizes the, the need for uh, friendship, for solidarity. Uh, Taru says, let's be human beings for a little while, just an hour. And uh, he tells him about his past. He tells Ryu about his past. To make things simpler, let me begin by saying I had plague already long before I came to this town and encountered it here, which is tantamount to saying I'm like everybody else. So this is, uh, well, what do you think it is? Everybody has the plague already. Yeah. Even when there's no plague. That's, the, that's yeah. what we go on to find out. It's not, the plague doesn't have to be literally... The, the plague, plague. It the plague. Be other, it could be other things, but it could be like plague. Yeah. So, in in order to explain what he means. Yeah, I think that he wants to say that I have been through this in my lifetime. So. But not quite the same thing. So he tells the story. Yeah. He tells he tells the story of when he was a child, and uh, he. Uh, Respected his father, you know, was relatively close to his father until one day his father said, hey, son, why don't you come to work with me and see what daddy does for work? <laughs> his yeah. father was a lawyer. Uh, so they went to the criminal trial in which his father was the prosecutor. The fa yeah. His father was arguing for the execution of a man. Yeah, and that was so... How to say that? That was for him. That was uh, how to say that. He can't. Uh, he didn't want to accept that. Yeah, that was crazy. For it him. changed his. It yeah. changed his his picture of his father for yeah. sure. He couldn't believe that his father would prosecute someone. And he that. talks about uh, the face of the criminal. He yeah. says the only picture I carried away with me that day was a picture of the criminal. I have little doubt he was guilty. With criminals. Yeah, even he if he's committed. guilty, even if he's guilty, it's still a murder is, is what he's going to say. That little man of about 30 with sparse sandy hair seemed eager to confess everything. I uh, seemed so eager to confess everything. So horrified at what he'd done. So this is a person who admitted what he'd done and was horrified by what he'd done. Um, 
eventually Taru could only look at him. Uh, he looked like a yellow owl, scared blind by too much light. His tie was slightly awry, so his tie was crooked. He kept biting his nails on just one hand. Uh, you've understood, he was a living human being. Uh, so Taru realizes the torment of this person, even if he's a guilty criminal, he's basically having his life set about to being ended by the society in which he lives. So that's uh, a, another way of looking at the plague. At any point, you could be taken away and you know, executed by the state. Uh, the fact of your guilt or not is kind of beside the point. Innocent people get executed, it's happened. <laughs> um, in any case, it's a murder. Uh, yeah, he came to think of this as a murder, not as his father doing his job. Again, think about the Nazi concentration camp yeah. guards. Um, so it's wrong, even if it's your job. I, who saw the whole business through to its conclusion, felt closer to that criminal than my father could have ever felt. Uh, nevertheless, it fell to him in the course of his duties to be present at what's politely termed the prisoner's last moments. So the father goes to watch the execution. Uh, so this makes Taru even more, even more horrified with his father. Yeah, like um, he won the game and he just wanted to, you know. Oh, I don't think so. It's a... Uh, yeah, it's not like it's that. Part of his, it's part of his duty. It, it seemed to him like that, I would say. Maybe. And it, I, I, I think it's even worse because it's part of his duties. It's again, it's a machine, right? Yeah, it's a machine. That, it, doesn't it doesn't care. It doesn't care for human feelings. It's just yeah. how it should be and that's all. A part of his job, it says, in the yeah. course of his duties is to be there at the execution. Yeah, so, it's, it's good to compare it with, you know, that concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And it's good to compare it with the weather and it's good to compare it with the plague because <laughs> it yeah. just does what it does. Uh, it happens to be man-made, right? The system, the justice system of a society is man-made, um, but it is kind of creation as he finds it. So Taru fights against creation as he finds it. That's how they described earlier. Ryu said to Panalu, I fight against God's creation. <laughs> That's my job. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I fight against creation as I find it because I fight against disease and disease is natural. So I, I, I suppose I'm unnatural. Um, yeah. But Taru also decides to fight against the social order. He doesn't say exactly what he means. Um, he says, to my mind, the social order around me was based on the death sentence. And by fighting the established order, I'd be fighting against murder. Apparently, Taru is a big guy in different parts of Europe. Uh, it sa he says that he joined some group of agitators. He also says that he's known through many countries in Europe. <laughs> it's interesting. So he's yeah, part of some also, kind of... Yeah, I also mixed him with uh, Qatar. Do you know when I said that he uh, traveled to a lot of places? You know. Yes, I thought you I might have. I, I thought of Taru, but I said for for Tar. Yeah, yeah, I thought you might have mistaken because I remember a conversation. Yeah, I mistaken idea. because I I don't know, I'm their names are so. Yeah, <laughs> you have to get I'm, used to them. Yeah. Um. So um, we find yeah. out that he he's been some kind of resistance fighter before. Uh, he joined with a group of people he liked and he still likes. He spent many years cooperating with them. Uh, and he's been all through Europe struggling. Um, then he talks about how he realized that his decisions still wound up being death sentences sometimes because he was fighting in a resistance of some kind. Uh, it says, I knew that we too on occasion passed sentences of death. Here I can use the, where is it? Just a sec. Is this the pointer? Yes, here we go. Aha, there we go. <laughs> that we pass sentences of death. By the way, this is certainly a reference to Camus' own misgivings about being in the resistance. <clears throat> uh, because if he's aiding in the resistance in Paris, he's certainly contributing to the deaths of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it would be 
strange not to have any feelings about that, even if they are Nazis, they're still, you know, people. <laughs> uh, so I was told that these few deaths were inevitable for the building up of a new world in which murder would cease to be. Uh, that was also true up to a point, <clears throat> and maybe I'm not capable of standing fast where that order of truth is concerned. Whatever the explanation, I hesitated. But then I remembered that miserable owl in the dock, and it enabled me to keep on until the day when I was present at an execution. <clears throat> so he sees an execution in Hungary uh, with a firing squad, rifles, you know, firing at a man at a post, like a, what's it called? <laughs> or at a wall, I guess. I think he was at a post. Um, and yeah, it horrified him to see this, this execution. So then he came to realize that he just has to fight uh, against the, the idea of, of people murdering each other. <laughs> I came to understand that I, anyhow, had had plague through all those years in which, paradoxically enough, I'd believed with all my soul that I was fighting it. <clears throat> so he was kind of, he would say something like, if you're a part a cooperative part of the system working inside of the system, then you are, you're a part of it, right? If you're not fighting against it, then you're a part of it. Uh, and he realized that about himself. In any case, my concern was not with arguments. So this is right after he, he talks a little bit about his colleagues would give these very convincing arguments and he would come back at them saying, yes, but these other people can give also very convincing arguments as to why it's right to do this or that. Uh, so then he says, in any case, my concern is not with the arguments. It was with the poor guy, the, the, the guy who was going to be executed. And that foul procedure whereby dirty mouths, stinking of plague, told a fettered man, so that's a man who's tied up, that he was going to die and then scientifically arrange things so that he should die. This is a very interesting way of putting things. Uh, you can think about, yes, the concentration camps. Uh, uh, and that was horrible. They used, you know, a lot of bad ideas. Yeah, I, uh, Hannah, I, there's a, a writer named Hannah Arendt. She, I think, would call the, the concentration camps uh, corpse factories. Yeah. Um, just to kind of bring this through to being something that happens as part of a mechanical system, right? Yeah, That's the same they, thing here. They also used uh, human hair for, you know, their purposes. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, terrible. Yeah. It's certainly awful. Yeah. But it seems to me that this discussion, this scientifically arranging things so that he should die, is partially in reference to that. Um, it's also just... Uh, referring back to this sort of mechanistic thing, like this justice system is like the plague. It just does what it was designed to do. Like the bureaucracies that were mentioned earlier in the book, still functioning, even though the town is in the midst of, of a catastrophe. Uh, but these people doing their jobs with their mouths stinking of plague, they tell a man you're going to die, and then they start setting up a bunch of dominoes <laughs> that will result in him dying after nights and nights of mental torture. So he sits in his cell knowing he's going to die. Uh, so basically he's psychologically tortured and then murdered in the eyes of uh, Taru. And I'm inclined to agree with that assessment. <laughs> um, yeah, he goes on this, uh, he did this before about the asthma the Spanish, the crazy Spanish guy, asthma patient. Spaniard. The Spaniard, yeah. yeah. Asking, asking if he's a saint because he counts his peas and that's it. Uh, <laughs> which is an interesting and funny way of thinking about what it might be to be a saint. I think you were there. Were you, yeah. No, you weren't there when we had this conversation. About, yeah, I wasn't just last time. Uh-huh. I'm trying to remember if it was last time that we did the uh, chopping wood and carrying water talk. Um, I think you were there for that. It's a, stay, it's a saying in Buddhism um, where uh, in order to achieve enlightenment, you just do the normal thing. 
you have to free your mind and let's say your soul by just doing the normal thing that you would do and not thinking about it. I think it relates yeah, to this pretty like well. It's like on your instincts. But it's not even an instinct to chop wood. You have to, yeah. that's something you have to learn. And you can learn it so well that you perfect it and you can perfect it so much that it just becomes like breathing. And that, that, that would be kind of like a Buddhist position on that. You breathe, uh, that's what you do because that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Taru is really interested in this idea of how to become a saint. Uh, Ryu says, but you don't believe in God. Exactly. Can one be a saint without God? That's the problem. In fact, the only problem I'm up against today. So he wants to be an atheist saint. <laughs> uh, yeah. He wants to figure out what that means. Uh, and when you think about it, that, that at the end has to be again about what motivates people. I mean, I don't know, doesn't it? Because for Panalu, it is, uh, it is God that, that motivates him. It would be wrong for me to say it is salvation because if he's just motivated by salvation, then he's no special thing. Yeah, anyone. Just can, selfish, nothing else. Yeah, if you just want salvation, that's not not enough um <clears throat> so it's like he has we remember also that taru taru wants me uh, to be famous because of that to be famous no i don't think i don't think that no but you know he just said that he wants to be a saint he wants to be a saint i think he's sincere though i don't think he's he wants fame um maybe i misheard you did you say famous <laughs> yeah i mean maybe Remember though, he uh, he wants to. Taru wants to know what's inside himself that's making him do what he does. He doesn't know. Uh, even though he knows the world, he knows everything about people. Supposedly, that's what he says. But he doesn't know what's in his own heart. <clears throat> in fact, that's why he likes talking to Ryu. He says, "Maybe you can help me when I talk to you." He ex said exactly that. Let me ask you some questions and maybe your answer will help me with mine. Uh, so he's uh, different from Ryu, not just because he's not a doctor, but because he wants to know why he does what he does. <laughs> Where Ryu is like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, he's a philosopher and really yeah. just pragmatic. You know? Yeah, you said you said uh, it's because he has money and so he has time. <laughs> that, that's yeah. a that's a pretty good point. I I agree with yeah. that. Like he's he's a guy who has yeah, has traveled. He, he has money. He just earned money, and now he wants to think about his life. Ah, What's but, next? Like, but we've learned more about him. Yeah. He may not have been just uh, some, somebody. I, I wouldn't say he was a person driven by greed. Uh, he has money. But he also is a person who fought for, uh, he fought in resistance causes of some kind. They yeah, don't say yeah. exactly what. He has his own beliefs. And, yeah. You know. Uh, so at the close of this chapter and the close of this uh, presentation here, this discussion, uh, they decide to go for a swim. Uh, and it's again, they, it's, it's just affirming their friendship and uh, it's a good point that uh, they just had this deep conversation and then they go into the depths, into the ocean, right? Into the sea. Uh, so it's a parallel that they, that they have the deep conversation and then they go into the deep water. Uh, it says, for some minutes, they swim side by side with the same zest, the same energy, in the same rhythm, isolated from the world, at last free of the town and of the plague. Ryu was the first to stop and then swam slowly back, except at one point when they found themselves caught in an ice cold current. So you can think about that as when they're plumbing the depths of their own minds, uh, yeah. you can get caught in an ice cold current that takes you out to a bad place. Um, but they fight against that. Their energy whipped up by this trap. The sea had sprung on them. Both struck out more vigorously. So they head back to town, they feel refreshed, and they say, it's time to get our shoulder to the wheel again. 
which is a very good image of pushing the <laughs> boulder up a mountain. <laughs> they say we have to, Ryu says it's time to get our shoulder back, back at the wheel or something like that. You know, like pushing up against with your shoulder. Time to get back to work, basically. Uh, back to pushing that boulder. Okay. So that's where we are now. Um, for the last, actually, it's not the last session because we're going to have a session after where we just talk about, we might talk about some other authors with similar themes. Um, I have some ideas. I would welcome you guys, including you guys listening on YouTube and watching on YouTube right now, to think about uh, this is not for the next one, but for the final one. There's a final one that's after the book is finished. Um, if you would like to talk about some other author, book, movie okay. uh, with similar themes, uh, definitely feel free to. You can even email me about putting something in the slideshow about it. But yes, the next session will be the last session uh, about the book itself. Of course, the final session will also be about the book, <laughs> but yeah. uh, this is the last reading section. So if we want to suggest you some mm, book or you know, story, we can suggest you mail or what? Yeah, yeah. Basically, we want to uh, find- uh, We want some special kind of, you know, books like classics or, you know- No, no, we want to, we're we're trying to stick with the themes from this book, uh, so wow, like plague. well, either the plague or uh, about what some kind of misery. What or, motive? What? Well, no, it doesn't have to be. I have some ideas that are not miserable, <laughs> yeah. um, that are just about like what what is inside you, like what motivates you. Um, so I'm a big fan of the author Kurt Vonnegut. So I'm probably going to talk about some of his stuff because he has a lot of themes involving what makes people do what they do um, and what makes a person a person and what a person really is. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about that um, and some other things. Uh, I might push a bit more on some of the parallels here with, uh, with Buddhism because I see a lot of parallels in Buddhism uh, in the way that Ryu thinks about the world. Uh, the Buddhists often have these very pragmatic, uh, let's say proverbs, sayings, like the chopping wood and carrying water. One, and the one that goes simply, when you are hungry, eat your rice. When you are tired, sleep. Uh, fools laugh at this, but wise men know what it means. <laughs> That's an actual saying. <laughs> um, and it's very, it's very simple and straightforward. Um, and it's kind of, it, to me, it, Ryu reminds me of that. R Ryu reminds me of that saying a lot. <clears throat> so we might push on that a bit more. I haven't decided entirely what we're going to do in that last session. It's okay. a bit, it's kind of open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Jason, maybe you can also send us, you know, those books that you want to do with us, maybe to just read a little bit of them, what's happening and maybe to discuss. Yeah. What, what should be the next book? I can, I can send out a bit of support material for sure before that yeah, final. Yeah, but one. that's in mm -hmm. future. First, we have those yeah. two lasts. First, we have one more session about the book, yeah. directly about the book. Yes. Okay, so cool. Um, in that case, I will see you next time. Okay. All right. Okay, then see you next time. Bye-bye. You bye. too.